Hey, it's Scott Petrak with another episode of the Brown Zone Zone Coverage Podcast. I thought we'd be talking about a win in Joe Flacco's return to Baltimore. Boy, was I wrong. Here to discuss the Browns' surprising blowout, blowout loss to the Texans is Dave Chodowski of Go, the WKYC Morning News. Hey, Chad, how you doing, bud? Oh, man, like the rest of us, right? I mean, geez. You know, Scott, that's just like preparing for a marathon, you know, and you're, you're kicking butt, you're training, and everything's going right, and then uh, the first mile in, you blow out your knee. And it's over, you know, all that, all, all that work that goes into it. And, you know, you get nothing out of it in the end, except for, you know, hey, it was a great regular. And then you build on that. And as we do in Cleveland all the time, we say maybe next year. Right. I guess, you know, there's so much we're going to do. But I, I guess the positive is you can feed off of a fantastic season and feel like the culture's changed and, you know, they're going to be back. The negative is. I mean, boy, you definitely would have liked to have had at least one playoff win there to show what you had, especially since you were the favorite. And as we know in the NFL, you never know if you can get back the next year. So I I think there's mixed emotions for fans. Oh, for sure. And I think there's a couple things, Chad. Number one, you're right. Nothing's promised to you moving forward, period. Um, The way the loss happened, right? It wasn't. And, you know, you can have the old argument, would you rather get blown out or lose a close game? But it was so demoralizing and so one-sided that I think that obscures, at least for now, you know, and we're taping this on Tuesday afternoon, but, you know, at some point it probably fades, but I think right now it obscures the 11 wins in the regular season, the ability to overcome everything they overcame, you know, all the stuff we talked about all season long, the surprising journey, the magical Joe Flacco run at the end. I think the way they lost at least temporarily, um, overshadows that, which is disappointing. And I think if you lose, if they had lost in round two to somebody else in a close game, or even had lost kind of on a fluky play to Houston or whatever, just played better, right? I guess that's the bottom line, just played better. Um, then you can kind of look at it like, hey, they, they fought as hard as they could. They gave a great effort. But this is such a dud and such a downer that – I think it's going to take a while for people to be able to kind of reappreciate what a great season it was. Cause I do think it was, I mean, great, you know, we could, I guess, argue over the, the word great, but it was certainly a strong season. I think they overachieved given all the injuries. I don't think you can debate that. Um, it was just, it was just a terrible way to end. That's all. Now, if we go back to your opening monologue there, and and you said surprising loss. Let me ask you this though: I, are, are you referring to the way they lost? Like I, yes. I can't believe you're surprised that they lost because I mean, I, I we both picked the Browns to win, but I certainly thought there was a chance they could lose. We gave the scenarios last week sure. on this podcast of how they could lose. So and, and and I know I had a text chain going with a couple buds, and you know I said, hey, I think the Browns are going to win, but I also said. I go, the city's way too confident. I didn't like how confident. <laughs> and I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to be a downer and, and, and come across the wrong way. But the city was way too confident last week. That that was my only issue. Again, thought they were going to win. Right. But, I mean, are we – but are you really surprised they lost? Well, yeah. I mean, I didn't think it was impossible. I mean, they were only a two-and-a-half, three-point favorite, right? So – Obviously, that's a game that is close and anything can happen. I watched a whole bunch of the pregame stuff and the lead up. And, I, you know, nationally it was probably close to 50-50, but maybe slanted towards Houston. So, you know, obviously I knew they could lose. But I'm telling you, Chud, when I broke it down, and obviously I'm way wrong, um, I thought there was a way better chance that the Browns blew out the Texans than the Texans blew out the Browns. I mean, I thought I went position by position. I thought the Browns had the edge. I thought the Browns had the edge in, like, schematically, right? We talked about it last week. C.J. Stroud struggles against man coverage. Um, the Browns play a bunch of man coverage. The Texans like to play zone. The Browns know how to attack the zone. Like, it just felt like all these things lined up in the Browns' favor. What I think I under and underestimated. And it wasn't the C.J. Stroud factor, because I knew it was going to be a big difference with him. But I, I think I underestimated 
how motivated the Texans would be coming off that Christmas Eve loss, right? It was such a thorough beatdown administered by the Browns that I think that really Good motivated call. the Texans. And I kind of looked at it like we were going to see it again. Like the matchup is just – Good for the Browns. You know, I can see it happening again. And, you know, I don't know if the Browns were overconfident. And you talk about Cleveland overconfident. I don't know if the Browns were overconfident. Um, I don't know if they lacked some energy because how easy it was the first time. But I certainly think Houston was motivated by that and had confidence in having Stroud back and having the two defensive ends, Will Anderson Jr. and Jonathan Grenard, right, and having one of their linebackers back. And, like all of it, I, I think, really kind of emboldened Houston to, hey, we can do this. And then they have a plan. We already saw these guys. We know what they do. Let's design our plan to go get them. And, and they certainly did that. Yeah, that was great points you just made across the board there. And um, I, I agree with everything you said. But that's a little concerning, though, if you think that they were overconfident from uh, that win. I mean, they, they didn't have – I mean, C.J. Stroud didn't right. play. And, I mean, it's the NFL where, I mean, you play two teams, you play the same team in your division twice, and one game could go one way, the other could go another, and it's the NFL playoffs. I mean, that's disturbing to me if they were not mentally prepared. Do you feel yeah, that's mean, possible? Uh, well, I, no, I, like, I don't think they were prepared. I don't think, like, Kevin Stefanski or Jim Schwartz took anything for granted. I just, and I just wonder if, and I didn't get the sense, like, during the week I thought, they gave Stroud his due, and like I didn't hear anybody talking about going in there and blowing them out. I just wonder if human nature is, hey, we just played these guys. And it wasn't like you played them week four and a bunch of stuff changes, right? Played three weeks ago. It's like, man, we just went down and clobbered these guys. Um, I wonder if it's just human nature to think, well, yeah, it's going to happen again. Not that they didn't mm -hmm. go to practice hard and all those things. Like, but, you know, is there any type of mental letdown there? Um I just, you know, it, it feels like it could be human nature. I mean, when that collides with, you know, a motivated team with a great plan, um, and, you know, and your defense has its worst game of the year, your quarterback throws two pick sixes, right? Like, that is the mm -hmm. recipe for disaster. Oh, yeah. Recipe, and we talked about it last week. We said that's how they could lose. Yep. And, you know, I, I think we just got a front row seat to C.J. Stroud and uh, – this guy, this kid might be in the conversation. No, he, he is certainly in the conversation of one of the next great quarterbacks in this league to do that as a rookie. Scott, you know how difficult that is yeah. as a rookie quarterback with a, a first year head coach to yeah. do what he did. I mean, this guy, I mean, we knew he was going to be tough, but the, man, this kid's special. He is. And, you know, there's all kinds of crazy stats coming out of that, coming out of that game for him. Right. I think he's the youngest rookie quarterback to win a playoff game. Um, I know he's the highest draft pick to win a playoff game, being number two as a rookie. To win a playoff game as a rookie, being the number two pick. Um, you know, I, I think they were the first rookie head coach or rookie quarterback to win a division. Um, so it's all of that. And the way he does it, the poise he shows, obviously he's tremendously gifted. What might have impressed me most about him, Chud, is the Browns didn't get a lot of pressure on him, obviously, and we can talk about that. But, you know, you look at the stats and it says they got one quarterback hit on. Well, that's not right because I saw a JOK once, and I think it was Taki Taki the other time, drill him after he delivers the ball. And so maybe those don't count as quarterback hits. I don't know. But I know what I saw. And he stood in the pocket and delivered strike after strike, um, whether there's pressure or no pressure, right? And those turned out to be big plays. The one was – the I think one was a, the touchdown to – Dalton Schultz, the the tight end, right, when he got by Ronnie Hickman. Um, JOK is close to hitting him and, like, hits him after he releases, but he stands in there and delivers. So I, I think that's really impressive. Joe Flacco brought that up when talking about Stroud because not everybody has that, right? Quarterbacks don't like to get hit. And, and to stand in there and deliver, um, I, I think, really bodes well for uh, this kid's future. Yeah, and again – uh, we both picked them to win. I was on board with you. But I had a lot of people that came up to me during the week with concern. I, I, I take that back. Not a lot because, I, like I said, the city was overconfident. But there's about three people that I talk to, you know, on a weekly basis. I talk mm -hmm. to more than that, Scott. But, you know, three <laughs> guys that <laughs> that love to break down the Browns game every sure. weekend. 
And uh, two of them were really concerned and actually were predicting the Houston win. And I, I just kept every day last week trying to think in my head. But I, I was like, no, you know, I think they're going to overcome this. I think, you know, and the fact that they were favored in Vegas and uh, just the, the way they went down there. But ultimately, you know, if you remember, and I felt like an idiot for this, and I went on the record as an idiot because I picked them to lose in Houston in the regular season. Right. But obviously Stroud wasn't in the game. But part of the reason I did that was because the defense doesn't travel. And I just felt like Houston and obviously Case Keen, a much different story. But obviously the defense came to play the first time around. That's kind of what I expected the first time was what the defense did this time. They just got on the road. I mean, what is it about this defense on the road? I don't have that answer, Chud. And I've been trying to figure it out. And Kevin Stefanski said that he's going to, you know, do a – he didn't have time, you know, yet when we talked to him Sunday. Um, he said they're going to examine all that and try to figure it out. Um, you know, there's factors that we can point to. You don't have the energy from the crowd, right? Guys talk about that because this has been a – it's been throughout the season, right, where you've at, we've asked and the media's asked and we've talked about um, why the road – performance is so different and it's startling it's like 13 or 14 points at home to 30 on the road like the yardage is insane like the discrepancy is mind-boggling so it's come up before and there's a lot of talk about the energy right at home you have so much energy you get it you know they feed off the crowd the crowd feeds off them but you know it's a playoffs the crowd's loud in houston right you should be able to funnel or channel that energy um to serve you and the bronze have not been able to do that you know, I think part of it is at home, the crowd's loud. It slows the snap count. Like, that matters, right? The linemen are a little bit late getting off the ball. That helps the pass rush. And that's not a factor when you're playing on the road. But that shouldn't be enough. Like, it sh that should not be the difference between 15 and 30 points, right? Like, it just shouldn't be. So I, I don't have a great answer for that. I, I know our friend and colleague, Mary Kay Cabot, she really – thinks the quarterbacks that they face on the road play a big part in this. And and I think that's a factor. I don't think it's the biggest factor. You know, like Russell Wilson, um, you know, he's a good quarterback. He didn't have a great game against the Browns. The Broncos did. I think Wilson had a great game, especially throwing the ball. Um, Matthew Stafford had a good game the following week in L.A. Um, C.J. Stroud, obviously this game. You know, but they played Lamar at home and away. And they played Lamar better, you know, I mean, that one's hard because they lost They lost at home and won on the road, right? But Lamar had two good drives at home um, and then played pretty well on the road, you know. So I, I don't know how to consider that. Um, you know, Gardner Minshew had a huge day against him in Indy. And, yeah, he's an experienced guy, but he's not like a top 15 quarterback, right? So I'm not crediting the crap game and crap defensive game in Indy to playing a great quarterback in Gardner Minshew, you know. So – I think there's just a bunch of factors there. Um, and it's something they're gonna have to figure out, right? Because if you're gonna be if you're gonna take the next steps next year, and if you're gonna have again a uh, top five defense, right? They were number one this year, at least in the yardage categories, right? They weren't number one in scoring, they weren't number one in the you know the EPA stats uh, or you know DVOA stats. Um, but they had the number one yardage, number one pass defense, number one on third down, number one on first downs. Um, if you're going to try to do that again next year, you can't have this, right? You just can't. And you're going to get to your goals. Odds are you're going to have to win on the road at some point, right? Whether it's during the regular season so you have a good enough record that you don't have to travel in the playoffs, or you're going to have to go on the road in the playoffs, right? Like it just happens. You're going to have to win games on the road. So um, I don't have the great answer for that, Chud. And when you look at the game Saturday in Houston, like there's a lot of misdirection. And I think they took advantage of the Browns' attacking philosophy, right? They like to, to pursue the ball. They like to, you know, the defensive lineman charge off the ball. And you can fool them with some misdirection. And, but they're not the only defense that gets fooled by that. The Browns run a lot of misdirection on offense. So you saw a lot of similar plays that the Texans and Browns were running to try to confuse a defense. Uh, the Texans just had more success doing it. They attacked certain matchups. Um, you know, they went after Greg Newsom and got him a couple times. They went after rookie Ronnie Hickman, uh, the safety, and they got him a couple times, including the one big touchdown to the tight end. And, you know, some of that stuff changes. Like, if you can get pressure on the quarterback, then your back end isn't susceptible, right? But they weren't getting pressure on the quarterback. They were getting fooled. You look at that 76-yard touchdown 
to dump off to the tight end. Like, that's JOK. JOK played really well. I think he had four tackles for loss. It was all over the field. But on that play, the tight end stayed in long enough. JOK should be covering mm-hmm. the tight end. Instead, he goes after C.J. Stroud. It's a small completion. Martin Emerson makes a terrible effort on the tackle. Ronnie Aikman, like, runs himself out of bounds. It kind of gets pushed from the side, but doesn't do a good job contained. And then there's nobody else around. Like, there were just big breakdowns. And, you know, Kevin Spansky pointed to, you know, miscommunication coverage breakdowns and, you know, losing your gaps and all that stuff's true. And they'll say little things add up to big things. And I think all those things are true too, but the players did not pay enough attention to detail, right? Their eyes, they talk about their eyes. They weren't good enough with their eyes. So they got fooled by the misdirection and the motion. And if you're split second slow, a guy runs by you and that killed them. And then I think it was a really good scheme that they not, not, I don't know if they didn't adjust to it, but it took them too long or they were slow to adjust or what have you. Um, I, I just think they got out schemed and out coached that day. And it was a terrible time for that to happen. Man, really great breakdown there. Excellent answer. And, you know, just to admit that you're not even hundred percent sure. And I think a lot of people are in the same boat, but I do like the Mary Kay breakdown. And I do kind of sense a little bit of that to be true, but you also kind of have some good argument to that. So that that's really good. Um, feedback there on that but i will say this scott you know you you talk about the three different things you know whether the number one defense but when you hear people talk nationally you know media and so Mm -hmm. forth they say the number one defense right right so that makes that makes people feel like that's the number one defense in the nfl correct oh for sure and it's i mean that's like that's the stat that's referred to i'm just pointing out that uh, you know like the dvoa which is it's like it's like kind of like the war set in baseball. Um, like the Ravens and Niners are like at the top of that list this year and are up there historically. And so yardage, like you know, I think yardage is one way to gauge it, and that's the way the Browns are number one. I'm just saying there's other ways. And I, I think if you mm-hmm. ask any coach in the league, they would want to be the number one scoring defense. Now the Browns weren't, but they're also factors for that. They turned it over a league high times, which put the defense in terrible position, right? So – you know, that's why these the analytic stats like DVOA try to overcome all those things. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly legitimate to call this team the number one defense. And crap, they called themselves that all year long and still refer to themselves as that. So they took that and they ran with that badge of honor. Okay, well, let me give you the CHUD, the Chud way. Okay, <laughs> and let me tell you. And- and you know I've been saying it since the beginning of the season. And how many times have I asked you and I've tried to break down this defense? That is that is a bunch of BS. They're not the number one defense right. in the NFL. I've been saying it since day one. We broke it down each and week. They're one of the best. They are one of the best. But to say number one, I think that just is, uh, you know, that, that leads fans down the wrong path. They did not prove themselves week in and week out to be a consistent number one defense. And, and I think that that is going to have to improve that. I mean, you know, we could talk about quarterback and this and that, but, um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, there were weeks where I would be like, you know what, I'm wrong. They are a great defense. And then there are two weeks I'm like, eh, you know, they're, they're a good defense. And then there's other weeks where I'm like, they're overrated. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, man, what they presented in that playoff game, I think backs how I feel and tell me if I'm wrong. No, you're not. Um, you're not. And I would I, I would agree with you that they're not the number one, that they weren't the best defense in the league, right? Forget number one. They weren't the best defense in the league. They were too, too hot and cold, right? Too up and down. Um, I think of the games against, like, Tennessee where they gave 90 yards passing. And against Arizona where Arizona, whatever, finished with 100 and some yards, right? Like, those skew the stats. And – those, but that's part of the resume where they had dominant, dominant games. Um, but you need to be more consistent, right? It needs to be week in and week out. You can't just feast on the Clayton Tunes of the world and not stop the C.J. Strouds, right? So I, I do think that's part of it. I, I, they have a lot of talent, right? We know what they did up front. We know what they did on the back end. Like I think that's why I kept kind of fighting you when you would you know, talk about this defense on the road and – the, the defense's issues, I kept thinking, well, I see how good they are up front with Miles Garrett. I see how good they are in the back end. Like, they have Jim Schwartz. They have all these pieces, so it doesn't feel – it to me, it didn't feel like kind of an aberration when they had great games and when they were ranked number one. 
they just weren't able to do it week in and week out. And obviously at the most critical in the most critical game of the year. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Miles Garrett in this game? Because uh, he's taking a little bit of heat. Yeah. Um, I went. I went back and rewatched it. Um, obviously, it didn't have the impact you would expect and hope Miles Garrett to have. Right, three tackles, um, no sacks. So I, I get that criticism. I also think that uh, I'm trying to come up the best way to say it. you can take. They did a lot of stuff to reduce the impact of Miles Garrett. The Texans did, just like the Rams did, and just like a lot of teams do. And some have more success than others. And if you're winning the whole game and you don't know if the team's going to run or pass, you can't pin your ears back and go after the quarterback. Um, you know they ran away from him. They rolled CJ Stroud away from him. And like if you can't go get him, if you're blocking, if you're getting blocked with two guys and the quarterback rolls away. You're not going to be able to go get the quarterback. I don't care who it is. You're just not. Now, are there more play? Could he make more plays? I would argue yes. Um, did he have a quote unquote big enough impact? I'd say no. Um, do I think it minimizes how good a player he is? No. Do I still think he deserves to be defensive player of the year? I do. Um, I certainly think he's the top one, two, or three defensive players in the league this year and pretty much every year. I think he's that kind of a talent. Um, I think Laramie Tunsil, the left tackle, he's a Pro Bowl left tackle who they believe he should, and down in Houston, they believe he should be an all-pro guy. And that makes it tougher on a defensive end, right? Like, I watched the end of the Dallas game, the one of the regular season games, and Micah Parsons couldn't get close to the quarterback because he was getting – it was against Detroit, the, the crazy game with the ending or the game with the crazy ending. Panay Sewell, who's an all-pro right tackle, wouldn't let him get to the quarterback. And it was one-on-one. And Micah Parsons is a top-five defender in the league, right? So it's a tough matchup. He didn't win it enough. He didn't get a ton of chances to win it, to win the one-on-one battles. And they're not they're usually not one-on-one. They were sometimes. But he's also getting double and triple teamed and all that. So, yeah, I get it. He's the guy everybody talks about. You look at him and you go, go take over the game. And I thought he would. I thought he was going to have a big game regardless of Laramie Tunsil. I thought they'd move him around and he'd figure out a way. That didn't happen. I, I think it's tough when they're marching down the field at will and they're doing all kinds of things. And, you, you know, your your defense is just giving up chunk play after chunk play. I think it's hard for any one player to swing that tide and to change that, especially when it was misdirection and the great scheme and, all that stuff. So I get the frustration. Um, I'm not saying he played a great game. I think he can play better. But to me, that doesn't change my overall opinion of Miles Gibbs. So do we agree that the um, number one cause, because people like to break it down, right? Hey, what's the main reason they lost? Like, I mean, I think we're putting defense number one, and then we're moving on to Joe Flacco in, in the offense, right? No doubt about it. No doubt. I mean, they gave no up. Yeah, I mean, they gave up two – 296, I think, in the first half, 298 yards, which is more than their average for a game. They're down. They give him 24 points in the first half, right? Joe Flacco was good in the first half. Brown scored 14 points. Like, the defense didn't set the table at all. Now, maybe, you know, they get a stop to start the third quarter. Maybe Schwartz had figured some stuff out. Maybe they were, it was going to be that thing where in the second half, they don't let anything happen. You know, we saw a little bit of that in the, Detroit Rams game this weekend, right? All those points in the first half, then it really slowed down in the second half. Maybe that's the kind of game you were in for, and obviously the pick six has killed them. But they also gave up a, another touchdown drive, you know, in the third or fourth quarter. So, yes, for me, the number one reason they lost this game was because the defense did not come close to living up to its number one rank. Yeah, no doubt. But let's dive into Flacco now. Yeah. And the Flacco fever took a halt here in this game, no question. I mean, two pick sixes, Scott. Um, you know, that's uh, – uh, what, <laughs> what, what are your feelings on that? Yeah. I, here's what I want to say, number one, is like I get all the emotions involved with the way the season lost, okay? And I, uh, and I get everything that went poorly, and I'm not diminishing anything. And the goal is to win the Super Bowl, and this 
game was prevented the Browns from coming close to doing that. And I didn't think we talked about this last week. I didn't think it was crazy to have those Super Bowl ideas and thoughts, right? Because I thought this team had some of the characteristics necessary to get you there, right? Which was a defense and which was a good coaching staff and which was Joe Flacco playing at a high level. So uh, obviously a lot of those things or none of those things showed up like they needed to in Houston. What I, the reaction I don't like is the Joe Flacco turn, Joe Flacco turned into a pumpkin, right? Well, man, we knew this was a matter of time with Joe Flacco. Like he still played really well for four games in a row, right? He started five, played pretty well in that first game too, but that four-game winning streak, right? Throws for 300 yards every game, first quarterback in the history of the franchise to do that. Throws 13 touchdowns, throws 1,600 yards, right? Energizes the city, energizes the team, gives everyone belief, played at a high level, like threw for the most yards in the league in that four-game winning streak. So that doesn't disappear because he throws two pick sixes in really difficult circumstances, right? It doesn't mean he can't play anymore because he, like, Guys have bad games, right? Guys have bad games in the playoffs, right? Jalen Hurts, does anybody think he's done because he had a bad game yesterday? No. And I get he's 30. I get, and happy birthday, Joe Flacco turned 39 today. We're taping this on Tuesday. So, like, I get that part of it, but I, I don't like the, I guess, the overreaction to Flacco specifically. Now, you know, I, he was never going to be the starter next year for the Browns. And whether or not he's a starter somewhere else next year, Maybe that game changes things. I'm not necessarily – I don't necessarily think it should. Maybe it does. But I just didn't like that reaction, and I heard it um, a couple different places, and it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way because I don't think you can just erase what he did over the last month of the season. Having said that, the two pick sixes were the backbreaker. The defense had gotten a stop. You're down 10. You're moving the ball. If you can go score – who knows what happens, right? Maybe your defense gets a turnover. Maybe Miles Garrett gets that strip sack and it's a three-point game and it turns into a lead, right? Like, you never know what can happen. And he's responsible for the ball and he threw two pick sixes that ended the game. Now, to deal in a little nuance, the first one, James Hudson III gets killed at right tackle by Derek Barnett and Flacco doesn't have a chance to throw deep to Elijah Moore. They're trying to run a double move. Now, Flacco admitted after the game he should have taken the sack. He explained why he didn't. They had already overcome a second and long. He didn't want to be in another second and long situation. He was just trying to throw the ball away and couldn't get enough on it because the pass rushers got him around the waist. So, like, that's to me, that's a reasonable explanation. He should have taken a sack. He admits it later. He, I understand why he didn't, and it kills the Browns, right? Like, so, yeah, looking back on it, he should have either – Taking a sack or throwing it at the feet of Najoku who's running across a short cross, like that might have been the best play for him to make. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's on it's on Flacco, but there are extenuating circumstances. Like you want to trust your left tackle to hold up for a second, and he couldn't hold up. The second one, it's yeah, fourth I, and you know, the second one is fourth and two. You got to try to make a play. You know, you're down 17, you're running out of time. Um, he tried to fit it in and it didn't work. Like, you know. He's trying He's trying to make something out of nothing there. It bites him. Could he have gone somewhere else to the ball? Maybe. Like, I'm not saying that either of them are good decisions, and obviously they killed him. I can just understand how these terrible plays happen. Yeah, I think it's a great take on him in that game. And and I don't I, – I, I think that is ridiculous to say that, you know, the, the clock strike midnight or the pumpkin theory or whatever. I, I, I'm right. good with that on that game. But I will say this. Now, what is it when you tweet now, Scott? Is it you X'd? Or can you still I don't know, say but I, tweeted, I think you, I think you're allowed to say tweet. You're just not allowed to call it Twitter. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I want your reaction on this because I got a lot of reaction on a tweet that I put out. And my tweet here, or X, whatever it is, sure. it wasn't based on his play in the game. It was based on Flacco's legacy. And it goes back to that LeBron question I asked mm -hmm. you. And this is what I wrote. And I just want your, your – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you what I wrote. I don't know if you saw it or not. I'm going to read you what I wrote, and then I want your reaction to it, but then I'm going to explain it a little bit better. So this is what I wrote. I said, from potentially a Browns legend to just a former Ravens QB, hashtag Flacco. <laughs> Interesting. Well, my initial reaction is I don't. I, I would not 
my my thought would not have been go, to go Ravens quarterback, ex Ravens quarterback. Obviously, it's true, and you're not wrong. My thought was. I'm assuming he's not coming back, right? They haven't closed the door on it, but I'm assuming he's not coming back next year. That he's a footnote. So I, I think he went from a guy that could have, like you said, been legendary status here to a blip on the radar. A guy that was here for five games. You kind of think back, oh, remember those Flacco moments, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's the inability to win a playoff game kind of reduced, shifted how we view Joe Flacco. Yeah, see, I thought you might understand where I was going with that because, and a lot of people got pissed at me. I don't know. I can't know if I'm allowed to use that word on here, but, you know, whatever. A lot of people got upset about it, and I think partly it's because they just didn't think it through. My point was simply this. He he wins that game and takes him to the Super Bowl. We're starting to have conversations about, you know, is he the – you know, the, the the greatest Cleveland icon or whatever. Like, but here's the deal, man. I'm telling you, you and I have been around long enough. 20 years from now, we're not going to sit back here and relish in these five or six games and say, oh, that was the best time in Browns history. Like, I mean, Bernie's a legend. I mean, he took the Browns to three AFC championship games, and it's not his fault that they didn't go to the Super Bowl. And we all know how we feel about Bernie, right? I mean, so I guess my point is, is that 20 years from now, we're not going to think back on Flacco in that regard. You're going to think, all right, like you said, I mean, you know, he gave us a good ride. But at the end of the day, 20 years from now, I'm also going to remember how much pain he caused Browns fans year after year, beating them right. all the time. So, I mean, it's a, it's a collective effort. I think you have to get pris- out of the prison of the moment and realize, hey, hey, thank you, Joe. It was a good run. You know, it went well, but it didn't end well. And listen, I think he's a great guy. I love the family, man. Love, I love the story. I love everything about it. Like he, I don't, I don't think how many people watch uh, um, Go in the morning, but we, we, Austin Love did a live tailgate on Friday morning. Mm-hmm. It was hilarious, and he actually had people come in, Scott, and, and uh, I don't know if you follow him on social media or you saw any of that, yeah. but he literally had people at five, six in the morning tailgating. And getting ready for a game that was I on the road, that. it was awesome. Yeah, and did, did you say any? Yeah. And he had he had Tim Misney on, and Tim Misney gave this great like thought about Flacco and how he's a Cleveland guy. He was counted out. Like no, he's not a Cleveland guy, but he um, he uh, embodies Cleveland, yeah, a guy that yeah. was counted out, a family man. Like he gave this great answer, man. And I got into it because I expected him just to come on and say, hey, "We're going to make you pay." And Tim Misney <laughs> gave this amazing answer. And I was all about it, man. I loved it. And I'm like, gosh, Flacco, this is a great story. Everyone's buying these shirts, blah, 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 blah. I get it. I got caught up in it too. But 20 years from now, I'm not going to look back and think of Joe Flacco in anywhere near the regard of Bernie or LeBron or any of these guys. Yeah. But had he won a Super Bowl, then you would have. And that's my point. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, he's, you know, I'm, I was trying to find the right comparison because, you know, we've had quarterbacks that I've covered that have been fleeting, right? You get, Jeff Garcia for two years, or you get – he might have been one year. You get Jake DeLone for a few games, Josh McCown, right? Like, these blips, and they had – none of them had the success that Flacco did, right? Or in this this type of successful season that the Browns had that Flacco was such a part of. Um, so I was trying to find, like, the right comparison. Maybe it's like a Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Holcomb type of situation, right? Like, this kind of shooting star that maximized what he was doing and – and, and Holcomb had the great playoff game, but they still lose, right? And then mm-hmm. he's he's still, you know, you think if we write in the Browns history of the last 20 years, Kelly Holcomb's there, but he's not like a huge part of it because he didn't win a playoff game. He didn't stay long after that, right? Like, so I, that's kind of how I feel about Flacco right now. Um, you know, kind of an out of nowhere thing. I mean, Flacco had way better career than Holcomb did, but when they had their success with the Browns, it was an out of nowhere kind of thing. So, yeah, I completely get where you're going with that. And it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't diminish no. the, the, the last month and how everyone felt all. good and how he's embraced by the city and how he resurrected his career, right? But the ending, the ending could have been different, right? The story could have been different if the Browns had won in Houston, right? It's just That's just yeah. the reality. No, I love the Holcomb take, and I actually thought about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Home run take on your part there. That's exactly where it kind of falls in. Um, you know, if anything, what I my concern about it is, though, I was telling someone the other day, I'm a little bit nervous, though, that we just got a carrot dangled in front of us of what it's like to have a quarterback to take you where you need to go. Now, obviously, he didn't finish it off, 
But we have been searching, Scott, for a quarterback since they came back in 99 for the most part. You've had glimpses here with Holcomb or uh, Baker got you the playoffs, right. and we'll get to him in a minute. But, I mean, the w- what I'm trying to say is, man, now Deshaun has the pressure to live up to that. Like, hey, we finally got to live what it was like to have that. And I think there's even more pressure on him now next year. I think that's a fair take. Um, there's certainly a lot of pressure on him, right? And – because you, first of all, you this team has shown that it could win without him. It's shown that it could win without being necessarily quarterback centric, right? When Flacco got here, it became a lot about Joe Flacco. But before that, right, they're winning thirteen to ten with DTR, and they're winning with PJ Walker. Like, so Deshaun Watson feels like he's stepping back into a situation that's really good. And okay, go manage this team. Go make a couple of plays, and this team's good enough to win games now. The schedule's harder. It looks harder next year. Um, it's a bunch of good quarterbacks that the Browns are going to face. You know, Watson's probably going to have to play well. But, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's – they've shown that they can win without him, so why wouldn't they be able to win with him? And, and I think that does carry its own degree of pressure. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Chad. And it was such a fun story with Flacco, and we know what a divisive person – um Watson is right, and how he split the fan base. So you have that element yeah. to it, right? Like with Flacco and with Watson mm-hmm. out of the picture, they were an easier team to root for. And now it's back to Watson. Um, and may, you know, I, I think the off the field stuff is faded for a lot of people. And if he plays well, you know, people will be most of the people I think will be all in. Uh, but there, there's always that element, you know. And then you throw in the Houston factor of it, which I didn't spend a whole lot of time dealing with or talking about last week. Uh, but, you know, he's back on that field in Houston. It's some of the draft picks that the Browns traded to get him are beating the Browns, right? Harris, who had the second pick six, was one of the draft picks. But the Browns traded to Houston to get to Sean Watson. They're chanting MVP towards C.J. Stroud with the quarterback that he replaced is standing on the sideline, right? So there's all this entwined um, or intertwined, and I, I think all that adds to the pressure on Watson. Boy, I'm glad you brought that up. I almost forgot to bring that up. Uh, the, the players that helped beat them because of that trade. Um, yeah, that, that stings a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. I guess I, w- I would have never predicted. Like, who would have thought the second worst team in the NFL last year would come back to make you pay, Tim Misney, in one year? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Right. And, you know, now they have one more. You know, Stroud has one more win, um, playoff win with Houston than Watson has with the Browns, right? And Obviously, that's not the end-all, be-all, but it looks like, you know, if you had to pick, you'd rather have C.J. Stroud than Deshaun Watson, right? Anybody in the league would say that. So it doesn't mean it's a terrible trade, and if he takes the Browns to the Super Bowl, you you know, you'll have this discussion again. Um, mm-hmm. But the Texans have rebounded, and a, a big chunk of that is due to them moving on with and from the Watson trade. Yeah, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I'm assuming we'll talk weekly here until yeah. the Super Bowl to do picks and all that, and we can talk about it later. But um, and I got many. I have other things I want to ask you here. So if you could just keep this one quick. Yep. But bottom line is Deshaun Watson is the starting quarterback next year. Stefanski said that. Yep. So right. Yep. Okay. Uh, and g- again, keep this kind of quick. I'd I'd rather hear your breakdown in the coming weeks. But will is there any chance Flacco would be back? Give me a twenty percent chance. 20%? Okay. All right. So then we'll break that down in the coming weeks. So you're not leaving, you're not closing the door. I'm right? not. That's kind of a. I'm not. And part of that, real quick, is just the way his teammates talked about him Sunday. They think they can, they think that tandem could work. And that made me mm. think that maybe it could work. Interesting. All right. That's what we call in the business a tease, Scott, because we want people to keep tuning in here. In the exactly coming weeks. Right. So we're going to, that's going to be Petrax Flacco take coming to a <laughs> podcast near you. All right. But anyway, let's move. One thing I have to bring up, and I hate that I have to bring this up, but I've heard it. I've heard it a bunch and I knew I was going to, and it kind of annoys the, you know, what out of yep. me. But then, then I have to start thinking, all right. I mean, is there any legitimate legitimacy to it? Should have they rested their guys in the final game? Oh, yeah. I thought you were going somewhere else with that. Um, Yes, they should have. I don't think there's any legitimacy to that. Um, I have resisted writing it because I don't think it's a legitimate argument. I understand the question. I understand where it's coming from. There's been discussion about it. Stefanski got asked about it. The players got asked about it. Um, 
we talked about. You had to rest them. Guys were beat up. They've been hurt all year long. We saw guys get hurt in that Cincinnati game. Um, people rest their guys. The Browns aren't the only team that rest guys and to come back and win games. Like, that's not why, in my opinion, that's not why they lost. It was the right decision. Yeah, and, and someone brought up, you know, hey, the Chiefs, you know, they they rested guys, right? There you they, go. They, they had they had no problem winning. And then uh, another friend of mine brought up the Lions, but you know they played their start, but the Lions were still going for that two seed, which they ended up getting home field anyway because of the Cowboys, which we'll get to. But the bottom line is the um, Lions had something to play for still, and they almost lost their tight end Laporta. Somehow he found a way right. to get back on the field, right? So. Yeah. I agree. I I just think this is a way for people to come up with excuses. Yeah, and I get like I get where that could come from. They didn't play well. They'd won four in a row. Like I understand where the thought process, but I think it's all weighing. You know, like Stefan, not to sound like a coach, you make the best decision at the time, and you needed guys to get healthy. I mean, I talked to guys, and they said, yeah, they wanted the week off. They wanted to get healthy, right? I mean. You know, Amari Cooper, he said he could have played, but why would you play him in the finale if he can't even run in when you get to the Texans week, right? He wasn't the same guy. Yeah, he didn't look right. He, was he not, didn't look right, did he? He did not. He was yeah. not the same guy. And it would do a burst, and then there were times where he just couldn't get off the line of scrimmage. Uh, reminded me of last year when he was dealing with the poor muscle injury, right? Like, it was kind of hit or miss mm -hmm. if he could run hard. Um, you know, why Teller said he wanted the break. Joe Batonio needed the break. Like, so you're going to trot these guys out there at 75% and then go try to win the next week at 70% when the game actually matters? That just doesn't make sense to me. Where did you think I was going to go with that question? You said, uh, you know, you thought you knew where I was going. Well, you put planted the Baker seed in my head, so I thought you were going Baker there. <laughs> well, that's next, buddy. Here we go. <laughs> I mean, you know, at least the Steelers lost. Could you imagine if the Steelers had won and then Baker won and the Browns lost? It would have been like, oh, man, just more – chapters to write in the Cleveland misery book, right? right but right. at least the Steelers lost. But, man, I got to tell you, uh, and we'll get to our predictions from last week, I I guess I didn't realize how bad the Eagles really had it. Like, I, I should have dove into that more. I guess they just complete. It's a, I didn't watch the game. I had to go to bed. I watched the Bills Steelers game, watched a few plays of that game. But obviously the Eagles, man, I mean, they're just they, – they just tanked. And Baker just – I mean, I did not see that coming, Scott. Me neither. I can't I... – Chud, I I would Nick Sirianni went to he's gone to the playoffs like in all three of his years or three of the four years. Um, he who is that Nick Sirianni, right? The Eagles coach, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I would yeah, never, yeah. so I would never say, man, this guy should get fired, and I'm still not saying he should get fired. But like I could see that he might get fired, and I know there's been that talk ahead of the game, and I was like, that's ridiculous. They lose, whatever. They've been to the playoffs. They were at the Super Bowl last year. You know, like there's a bunch of stuff going on. He lost both his coordinators, but the the dramatic fall that the Eagles had from being ten and one, I think they were ten and one. And I know because I watched them early in the year, and they weren't playing great, but they're still figuring out ways to win. And you don't get to ten and one with smoke and mirrors, right? But for them to just fall off a cliff and then just get embarrassed yesterday, and it was. You know, it was an offensive scheme that looked like it didn't know what it was doing. It was guys that didn't want to tackle. In that corner, James Bradbury, right, used to be at the Giants. I, I mean, he's a big-time corner. There was one play where he just, like, wanted no part of tackling this guy. It was a third-down play, and it turned into a first down because he didn't make a tackle. And you saw that repeatedly. Like, run after catch, guys wouldn't tackle. And that's just a bad – you know, we talk about culture. That's bad culture. And mm -hmm. Philly didn't have that last year, right? So something changed. They had to, they fired or not even fired. They demoted their defensive coordinator in the middle of the season, and it got worse. You know, they demoted mm -hmm. Sean Desai, and it got worse with Matt Patricia. Like there's a bunch of stuff going on there. So when we talk about the Tampa game, I'm with you. I thought Philly was good enough. They figure it out. Jalen Hurts, yeah, right. Like Tampa's not. Any, I mean, Tampa didn't score a touchdown in this last two games of the regular season, right? Like, I know. They, they beat Carolina nine Carolina. nothing. Yeah. But Carolina yeah. and I know the Carolina's awful. And then they put up 30-something on the Eagles. Like, that just shows you how bad it is for the Eagles. So, um, cool. you know, I, I kind of credit – I don't – I mean, Baker, he won the game. He was just credit. He actually made a bunch of good throws. Um, but that was – that was a good matchup for Baker because it looked like the Eagles wanted not – didn't want to – 
didn't really want to be there. Baker Mayfield continues to be the number one guy that confuses the you know what out of me when it comes to the NFL because we've talked about this before. One minute I think this guy doesn't belong in the NFL, and the next minute I'm like, this guy is pretty darn good. Like, I, you know, oh my gosh, he, so frustrating. There's just no way to break this guy down for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Like, I've come to, and who knows, I could change my mind next week or the week after. But for me, he's a second, second or third, third tier guy, right? Like he's not a team. He's not a guy you build around. He shouldn't have been the number one overall pick like he was, but he can play in this league. He probably he deserves to have a starting job. Like he's, you know, is he twentieth? Is he eighteenth? Is he, you know, sixteenth? Is he somewhere in there so where you can win some with him? He's gutsy. We all know that, right? All those things we knew about Baker. He throws it pretty well. He's got a pretty good arm. Um, struggles when there's pressure up the middle. Struggles when the pocket gets condensed because he's not the biggest guy. Um, you know, kind of prefers to roll out and make stuff happen. Um, so certainly not the ideal quarterback. And I understand what the Browns saw and thought, if we're going to be the team we need to be and compete with the Mahomes and the Allens and the Burroughs, um, we need an upgrade over Baker Mayfield. Like, I still think that argument makes complete sense. Now, we can fight about whether or not Deshaun Watson was the right guy, and whether that trade was the right trade. But I understand that thinking. And you've seen it across the league where a team says, you know, whether Washington with Kirk Cousins, yeah, we really can't win with this guy. He can only get us so far. And I feel like Baker's that kind of a guy. Um, and even if he, like, let's say he won a Super Bowl, right? Like, he's still never going to be, which is unbelievable. The Browns have never won a Super Bowl. I get it. But, like, I think there's a ceiling to what Baker can do for you. Um, and you're trying to get past that ceiling, right? Like, that's the argument, and I completely understand that argument. But that doesn't mean he can't play, and it doesn't mean he can't win a game and win a big game, and we've seen that. Okay, so here's the deal, because we're, we're starting to get long, and we want to get yep. to the playoffs. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. We'll do this again next week, right? Yep. So let's, let's, let's tease these three topics. Doesn't mean we won't have more, but yep. we're going to talk about the Flacco. You gave 20%. I want to dive into that. Yep. I want to dive into Baker more, and if – you know, Browns fans really should. And you kind of just answered it, but I want to break it down more, you know, because there are a lot of people that still think he should be the guy here. And then there's another part of the fan base that clearly doesn't. And then the other thing I want to talk about, which I wanted to get to today, but let's pass and, and do it next week, is the importance of winning the division. And if yeah. you think they can win the division next year, but yeah. let's put that on hold until next week with a few other topics. Uh, but before we get to the playoffs, is there anything else you really want to hit before we go to the playoffs? No, I think the other things on my list, I think they hold. I want to talk about, you know, the roster and how it's going to change. You know, who's free agents, who's going to leave. You know, we'll probably okay. have we'll probably have Stefanski Barry extensions some point soon. So we can talk about that when it happens. Uh, I fully expect those to happen. Um, okay. If there's any if there's any changes to the coaching staff, right? Could we see changes yeah. to the staff? All right, I just wrote all those down. So uh, we will talk about those next week on the pod. So good stuff. Yeah, because, gosh, if we start getting into all that, we'll right be out here for two hours. Right, yeah, right. So. We, got, we, got, we got a couple of months. We're good. We're good. We're good. We have, we, right. But as they're we know, there will always be they're something. Not playing right? They're not so. playing another game for a while. So. Yeah, no, no doubt. All right, let's get into the uh, playoffs here. Um, you went three and three on your predictions. I went four and two. Uh, boy, it's a tough loss last night. Well, not yeah. tough, but I, I just I, I'm embarrassed that I picked Philly, and I think right. you did as well. Yep. Uh, we both got the Browns game wrong. We both went with the Browns. Um, uh, how about my pick of the Packers, Scott? Yeah, that was a good one, Chud. Uh, that was really good. Cowboys. I mean, and it wasn't it wasn't close, right? There, talk about talk about changes. There's got to be changes in Dallas, right? I mean, Jerry Jones can't stick oh. with Mike McCarthy. You know, and I think they can stick with da I think they can stick with Dak. I like Dak. I would take Dak in a heartbeat. Um, but I know people in Dallas they're kind of fed up with it a little bit too. Yeah. So uh that's the swing game, but the difference between three and three and four and four, because we both got the Eagles wrong, we both got the Browns wrong, I got the Packers right, and then we both got the Lions right. No, actually I got that one wrong, Chud. I went two and four. Oh. I forgot it. I forgot Whoa. about the Lions game. Yeah, I thought the I thought the Rams were going to go in there and win. Yep. 
Oh my gosh. Are you yeah. sure you took Philly? Yeah, I guess you did. Oh yeah, my gosh. Yeah, okay. sure, right. Sorry, man. I, well, I was trying to give you a three. And three. I know. You I, 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 thought you, I thought you were right, but no, I was. I thought the Rams were going to go in there and win. They could have. It was a close game. but Yeah, well, a one point game. It was actually the close. All the games were blowouts, but that one. Yeah, that's a good I mean, game. If you really think about it, super, super wild card weekend wasn't that super, you know? It was not. You know, we see that a lot. Um, but every once in a while you see a great weekend, but yeah, it was a dud of a weekend. It was a dud of a yeah, it was. playoff weekend. All right, so you went Rams, I went Lions. We both got the Chiefs over the Dolphins. Yep. And we both got the Bills over the Steelers. Correct. So um all right, so there you have it. Um now we are down. This is I think this is one of my favorite weekends of the year. I love it because you have yep. two games on Saturday, two games on Sunday. It's the last weekend where you have both days. Um it's just even though the spreads are high on all of them. I love all the matchups because I love the history with the Packers and the Niners. And just that thought that, oh, can Green Bay do it again? Sure. And I just I think that's a great Saturday night game. Um, I love I, – I, well, all right, well, hold on. I'm not going to say love. But the fact that Stroud versus Lamar I think is yeah. an intriguing matchup. Okay. And then you got Baker Mayfield against the upstart – the upstart. I mean, what? Wow, that's – I mean, the Lions. I mean, they fight – Win a playoff game for the first time in what since ninety one, right? And um, that's a great story. Uh, that game's on NBC, by the way. Cheap okay. plug: Lions Packers or Lions Buccaneers. And then, it, I'm sorry, and you can be annoyed, Browns fans, but Bills Chiefs. It's must see TV. I mean, I, I I look forward to that at six thirty on Sunday. So, um, do you agree that even though the spreads are high on all of them, they're intriguing matchups? Oh, I think they are. Um, I, I think there's potential for. Two or three blowouts. Um, I don't know if we'll have them, and I'm a little gun shy after I was so bad last week. Um, but I love, I, yeah, I like the matchups. I think there'll be way more exciting games to watch, and, and I think that Chiefs Buffalo game could be epic, like the other the other matchups have been. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Super Bowl. You had the Bills and Cowboys, so you lost the Cowboys, but you still have the Bills. I had the Chiefs and Niners. Th thoughts on that? The Cowboys. Yeah, it was, I mean, I didn't see that coming, right? It's, again, they played well in the regular season. And here's – real quick, here's well, I think one of the differences between, like, the Cowboys and the Browns. The Cowboys, this was like the eighth year in a row where they had high hopes and they were really good in the regular season and they can't win a playoff game, right? The Browns, this was kind of the first year. And I know 2020, was, but that was four years ago, they actually won a playoff game, right? Like, the expectations in Dallas have been huge for a long time. They think they have the quarterback. They thought they had a Super Bowl winning coach. And for them to lay an egg at home and it wasn't close, like that's the kind of loss where it makes you reconsider everything if you're Jerry Jones. And I think they do have huge, like a major overhaul. And that's different than the Browns where this is the first year they overcame all these odds to get there. You know, even though they were both lopsided losses, I, I think the ramifications and the feeling is different. I totally agree with you. Um, I put something out there on X the other day about that. Like, if you're feeling crappy, Browns fans, and it's not going to take the pain away, at least you're right. not the Cowboy fan right now. I mean, yep. that, you're the two seed with home field advantage and the expectation. Yeah, I, home they run got undefeated at home, there. right? Like, they got undefeated yeah. at home, like all of it. Yeah. Do, have you seen the stats about the Packers just owning them, though? They've won more postseason yeah. games in that stadium than Dallas has. It's crazy. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. <laughs> The Packers. That, that's it. Um, so, all right. Uh, so, uh, bottom line is, though, you still got the Bills. Yeah. So, three of our four Super Bowl predict teams are still left. So, uh, one of them is going to go away, though, with the Chiefs versus yep. the Bills. And uh, we'll see what happens there. So, all right, let's get into um, predictions here. Let's start with the first game. Ravens hosting the Texans. Ravens favored by nine. Who you got? Yeah, give me the Ravens. Give me the Ravens to cover. Um, I don't feel great about that, but I, I, for a couple of reasons, I think the Ravens are really good. Um, now they've been resting a while; they didn't play that. They didn't play their starters, most of their starters in the last week. So Lamar's been off for it's going to be three weeks now. Uh, I don't think it'll matter. Uh, I think the Ravens are really good on both sides of the ball, and I think Houston, as well as Houston played, it feels like one of those teams where you know you have a really big win and then you go. On the road, step up a class. You're young. It's going to be harder for them to win on the road. Really good team. Um, so give me the Ravens. Although I'm a little, I'm a little trepidatious about that pick, but I'm going to say the Ravens and I think the Ravens cover. 
Yeah, yeah. Do, do we have to go cover here? Or we no, just I just, the you know, I'm just adding yeah, you know, yeah. bonus, <laughs> bonus for the yeah. listeners. I, it's almost it's almost a trap, right? Like you're like, yeah. oh, I'm going to take that nine and a half or nine points of Stroud, right? Right. Um, so I'm going to go Ravens as well. Uh, I think they win the game. That said, we could see something special here if Stroud were yeah. going in there to upset the Ravens. Then you'd be you'd have to sit there and be like, okay, um, right? You know, and maybe that makes the Browns look a little bit better too. You know, yeah. if, if yeah. they going in win that game. So I mean, something like that. And there's uh, questions Niners. about Lamar. I mean, Lamar hasn't won a playoff game, right? Or it's been a long time. So I think mm -hmm. there's questions about Lamar in the playoffs. I expect him to answer those, but like you say, he's got to show it. Yeah, I'm going to take the Niners over the Packers. Uh, that hurts me because uh, you know I I uh, I, I have I think the Packers. My buddy and I decided uh, decades ago that if you know when the Browns when the Browns left in '95, we're like, what team are we going to root for? And we we decided on the Packers because it just felt like the. They weren't an AFC team, wasn't a rival, loved their fans, mm. that fan base, like, you know, just kind of the um, community, like it's not in the downtown area, um, you know, just something about it. So I've kind of always had no issue with the Packers, but I, I, I've always, always kind of liked to root for them when the Browns are not involved. That said, the 49ers were my pick for the Super Bowl, and I just don't know if the Packers can go on the road and, and win two in a row like that. Yeah, I think it's asking a lot. I like I like the Niners big. Niners big. Okay. All right. So we both agree on the first two games. Third game. This is probably, I guess I, I would say that um, I, I could see like a CJ Stroud first and the Texans pulling it off somehow. Like I could maybe visualize that. Hey, the Packers beat Dallas. Why not beat mm -hmm. San Francisco? This is the game I feel most confident about. And next week, if I'm wrong, I'll be like, hey, I just didn't see it coming. I got the Lions beating the Buccaneers. And I know you could say, well, I mean, it's the Lions. They're going to choke. I just think they're different, man. I, they, if you watch their locker room celebration, just the, the attitude of this team, um, certainly they could lose, I guess. But I, I don't think Baker's going to go in and win, win in Detroit. Uh, I'm going to go Lions. What, what's the spread in this game? You know, That is uh, six, six and a half. Okay. Um, I can't, I, I'm going to take the Lions. I think Baker, you know, I think it's hard to win on the road. I think the Buccaneers are flawed. Although they got some weapons, you know, some guys for him to throw to. The Lions have some issues covering guys. Um, I think it, I think it's, you know, you said you wouldn't be surprised about the Saturday games or the first two games. This one of all, of those three games, I like the Bucks the best. I like the Bucks chances the best. Um, you know, Todd Bowles really confused Jalen Hurts in that offense yesterday. Could they do the same thing to Jared Goff? Could they get him to throw a couple picks with that blitzing? Maybe. Um, I think the Lions can be vulnerable in their secondary. Having said that, I'm going to take the Lions. Yeah. If the game was in Tampa, I would agree with all of your points. Since it's in Detroit, yeah. I'm, I'm feeling really heavy about the Lions. But <laughs> we'll yeah, I, see. Might take, I might take we'll the see. points there. Like, I might take Tampa in the points if I were a betting man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the last game, this is the most difficult one. Bills, right now, I saw three and a half yesterday, I thought. Now I see two and a half. At home against the Chiefs, Mahomes' first playoff road game. How about that? Um, what do you think? I'm gonna let you go first. Bills hosting the Chiefs. Oh, I think so I know I, where you're gonna go. I was kind of, I was almost gonna go opposite you just so I could try to close the gap in a playoff fix. Um, I'll go first. No, I'll that's go first. Right. No, I don't want to cop out. You know what? I, I know who Chiefs. you're. I know who you're gonna pick. No, I'm gonna take go the ahead. Chiefs. What? I'm gonna go against my Super Bowl pick. I'm gonna take the Chiefs. Um, I know Mahomes has not had to go on the road for a playoff game. It's probably a bad pick, but I can't pick against Patrick Mahomes. Like, that's what it boils down to. I can't pick against Mahomes and Reed, and I'm going to pick them. Wow, I did not see that coming. Yeah. I thought you'd go Bills for sure. You're a Super Bowl pick at yeah. home. Well, maybe um, if I lose, yeah. I still got my Super Bowl pick. Who knows? You know? Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, I'm with you. I'm going Chiefs. Are you I'm really? Going, I'm yeah, I'm going with you. I, and I was it had nothing. To, no matter what you did, I was going Chiefs. Um, I, I just I agree with everything you just said. Give me Mahomes. I'm not Josh Allen, dude. The guy's a stud. I mean, yeah. we know. I mean, he's he's won me a fantasy title. He's uh, I mean, eye candy to watch. He's uh, an amazing quarterback, and they have the home field advantage. Boy, am I talking myself into the Bills right now? I, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just think uh, I just think this is going to be a wild one. The Chiefs come out on top. That said, of the four games, 
this is this is the one that could go either way for sure. Yeah, I agree, I completely agree with that. Like if you um, if you have, not that not that the other games can't go the other way. I'm just saying if you ranked them one through four and said which game has the potential the, to most to go either way, I would oh, say this one. There's no doubt, and I think it'll be the best game. Um, you know that we've seen the matchups in the playoffs before. I think you know Kansas City probably has a better defense. Um, you know Kansas City probably has a better quarterback, but not always. Like <laughs> Josh, I'm so thinking good. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to that game. All right, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting to uh, see how we get down to the AFC and NFC championship game. But uh, again, Scott, I guess bottom line, what a ride for the Browns. Yeah. See, I, I wrote it down exactly how I wanted to say it. Uh, well, that's not that amazing, but I'll just say <laughs> what a ride, bro. <laughs> what a ride, brutal ending, right? What a ride, brutal ending. That sounds right. No, you're exactly right, Chad. That's that sums it up. Yeah. So uh how about this too? I uh on this podcast, uh I came close to walking four miles. How about that? Did you really? No, I'm just jealous. <laughs> I've been I've been walking this whole time. Wow, you sound great. So, I'd be huffing and puffing yeah. like a crazy person. Wow! Yeah, I no, saw I, your um, I saw your hundred mile challenge. I got to get on that. That's what it is. It's yeah. um a hundred miles in thirty one days, and uh, I had to figure out how to do both of these today. And I'm like, well, if I'm able to do both, I'll do both. And luckily, where I'm at, there's not a lot of people, so I didn't like blow them away with my voice. Yeah, that's so, so strong, uh, Chad. Nice work, buddy. Well, you know, hey, if you're listening right now and you're thinking about getting out and getting some exercise, go get it, man. Because yeah. the uh, wintertime blues, they can get you. No, you're right. I'm gonna get up and do something here. So, cool. Yeah, there you go. Wait, I know if I know if it was nice enough. Huh? You, you know what? Is isn't it like a golf simulator somewhere? Yeah, I'm gonna have to get to Top Golf or something this week. The, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Top Golf. There yeah. you go. I like that idea. Planted in my head. So yeah, there, yeah. there you have it. Cool. All right, we'll talk next week. Thanks, bud. I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody listening. This has been another episode of the Zone Coverage Podcast, and you can read all my work at brownzone.com. Thanks.